It's time to nerd out. It's June 4th. Do you know what happened on June 4th, 1982, 40 years ago today? I went to the Boulevard Theater back in Queens with my friend Dave, and we saw Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, the day it opened. My favorite movie. All right, you're here to talk about comedy. So how about the Saturday Night Live parody that aired in December of 1986? No, not that one. The other one. It was called Star Trek V, The Restaurant Enterprise. William Shatner is your host. He plays Captain James T. Kirk in Star Trek V, The Restaurant Enterprise. The Enterprise has been bought out by the Marriott Corporation and turned into a seafood restaurant. The crew is threaded when Khan brings a health inspector to the restaurant, though Kirk resolves the situation by slipping the inspector a bribe. Kevin Nealon played Spock, Phil Hartman as McCoy, Victoria Jackson played Janice Rand, now a waitress instead of a yeoman, Dana Carvey as Khan, and he also voiced Scotty and Chekhov. Kevin Meany plays a choking victim who is saved by a Vulcan Heimlich pinch delivered by Kevin Nealon's Spock. As Kevin Meany is choking, Kirk, Dr. McCoy, this man needs medical attention. McCoy, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a, oh, okay, sure. (laughs) Ha ha ha. All right, and we'll talk about the other sketch from that same episode, the William Shatner Get a Life sketch. In it, Shatner plays a version of himself attending a Star Trek convention, hosting a Q&A. After a few too many over-specific questions, Shatner breaks down and says to the crowd, Get a life, will you people? For crying out loud, it's just a TV show. He says to one fan, You must be almost 30. Have you ever kissed a girl? <laughs> Love it. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan turns 40. I will be watching it tonight. Nerd, yes. Jim Norton is in Delaware tonight. No chance Jim Norton watches Star Trek 2 tonight. I know, Jim. There's no chance. Plus, he's got a show in Delaware. Jim said, comedy was something I always wanted to do that I never thought I would do. I signed up for New Talent Night in New Jersey in 1990 because I wanted this girl I was dating to think I was cool. If I knew anything about comedy, I'd say that's the last thing you do if you're looking to get women. Get in a band. I really screwed up. I never actually expected to do it. I said, eh, I'll sign up, but I knew something would prevent me from going through with it, but nothing did. I did it, and I couldn't believe I did it. I just started showing up once a month for a new talent night, and it was about a year before I got a paid gig. What made it happen was just showing up, always writing material, and getting on stage as much as possible. Jim said one of his favorite projects was the run on the Opie and Anthony show. It was an extremely popular show and had an influence on the ways people podcast and attitudes in podcasting. It's nice to know we had maybe some negative influence, but some positives too. He also mentions Lucky Louie, the HBO sitcom, which really should have gotten more credit. It was very funny and also Tough Crowd. One of the greatest compliments I get is that young comedians tell me they were influenced by it or they watch it and it means something to them. That always feels great. It always makes me feel old, but I'm happy to be around to hear that. Jim Norton, what comedians do you remember watching and looking up to when you were a kid? Norton said, Richard Pryor is the first and the one I love the most. Wish I had a better answer because every comedian over 30 says Richard Pryor. I'd have to say him, George Carlin, Woody Allen, Robert Klein, and Joan Rivers. I'd stay up late and watch all those guys tape their sets, play them back, and pretend I was saying those things. I've always thought Joan Rivers was underrated. Been a lot of talk about Joan lately, which is fantastic. Everybody knows she was great, but she'd be mentioned in the top five comics. She should make all of those top five lists, and unfortunately, she doesn't. Jim loves stand-up because the reaction is so immediate and it's around you. The laughter is almost a physical thing hitting you. You're in the room with a lot of people making them all laugh. You can even make them laugh about the things they disagree with because the joke is good. You don't have to change opinions but it's just funny to get people to laugh at things they don't agree with. Norton was asked about the current environment and whether or not it's harder to be a comedian now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Jim said, no, I think the sensitivity people are displaying is not real. It's based in a desire to be heard. People are using jokes to springboard into a larger conversation. And to do that, they say that it's triggering. If that's the case, how come nobody's having this discussion about actors and what kind of roles they're allowed to play or authors and what subjects they can write books about? I'll believe that the culture is triggered by jokes when there's not a line around the block to see it. Nobody complains about John Wayne Gacy, Richard Ramirez, or a Ted Bundy documentary. Nobody gets mad at anyone involved, but if you joke about the wrong subject, people expect an apology. I don't believe that's really outrage. I think it's desire for attention. And the outrage is just a mask for that. I just sped up there knowing Jim. He probably said this in a very calm voice when you speak to Jim in real life. Pretty soft spoken. So let me slow down here. People's perspective of what's pushing the envelope is very selective according to what makes them comfortable and what their personal circle of appropriate is. I used to go watch Paul Mooney and there were a lot of things he said that I disagree with. But you know what? I laughed. 
I never thought he should get in trouble because I didn't agree with him. A comic's job is not to change your mind. It's to express a point of view or to make fun of the world or anything in it. And everything in it, people say, being a comedian is responsibility. That's a lie. It's just an excuse as to why a comedian is punishable. You can't say, hey, I don't like you, so you shouldn't be allowed to say that. It's too revealing of a narcissistic motivation, so you have to put a higher motive to it. You're dangerous and you're hurting people. It's just not true. Louis C.K. was on Shane Gillis's podcast about a month ago, and he talked about social media and why he's not on it. It didn't make me feel good. Anytime I tweeted about anything, I was like, ugh, I don't like the way that came out. And then four and a half million people saw it. It was the worst things I ever said. Heard and seen by the most people was the worst possible scenario. It's too instant. I don't think the speed helps dialogue. I think that's why everything's effed up and polarizing, because people are going too fast. They're trying to react too quickly. Vulture interviewed a bunch of comedians. Here's the question. Material aside, which creative choices did you make while filming your special that you're the most proud of? Marina Franklin said, The ability to bring everything I've worked on so hard back to my hometown of Chicago. All the elements were there. Family, my love of house music, and a general feeling of home. Lorel Howery said, Too many to answer. For live and current shots, using the gym and having lift every voice and sing with an all-black girls step team to open. Also using film. Kyle Kinane said, Telling production for Loose in Chicago that I picked the Cabaret Metro in Chicago because it's the Cabaret Metro in Chicago, so don't F with the look of it. I picked the 40 Watt in Athens for I liked his old stuff, and when I got there, design team had constructed a whole fake background. I felt, why let me pick a location if you're going to transform it into whatever you want anyway? Kurt Braunhaller said his favorite part was that I had four professional dancers dress up in beaver suits and do a tightly choreographed routine as I grabbed on a rope and ascended into the rafters at the end of my show. River Butcher said, since I've only done a Comedy Central half hour, my creative choices so far have been limited, but I guess I'd say going with a name I knew I was going to change. River Butcher used to go by Rhea Butcher. Meow.com. Am I saying it right? It's M-E-A-W-W-W.com. Meow, right? Yeah, yeah. They started writing about Amy Schumer's net worth. How much do you think Amy Schumer is worth? I'll give you three seconds to think about it. And two and one. Meow thinks Amy's current net worth is estimated to be $25 million. But there have been fluctuations in her wealth over the years, depending on her projects. Forbes reported that Amy Schumer pocketed $37.5 million in 2017 alone. Amy was reportedly set to make $11 million for the leather special in 2017 when she found out that Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle made $20 million each for their specials. Her team renegotiated her contract and got her $13 million. Meow says the American comedian owns a West Side penthouse apartment, the 4,500 square foot home in a pre-war building, spans five bedrooms and six bathrooms, a key-locked elevator, opens directly into the full floor space, the solarium-style home offers ravishing views of the Hudson River, the GW Bridge, and New York City's skyline. Schumer bought the home for $12.15 million in 2016, and she called it her Manhattan Dream apartment in an interview with the Wall Street Journal. Yahoo looked into the question of how much do comedians make on TikTok? 25-year-old Ben Brainerd has more than 2.4 million followers on TikTok and around 375,000 followers on YouTube. Despite that difference, he says he makes far more money from YouTube. According to Brainerd, he made $4,046 from his Facebook videos in December 21, or $2.53 per thousand views. On YouTube, he made $5,267, or $0.26 cents per thousand views. Meanwhile, TikTok paid him $476, which was about two cents per thousand video views. So if you say pantomime to Donald Trump videos on TikTok and you had zillions of views, you probably didn't make that much money. It's a good thing you parlayed that into a Netflix special and a CBS development deal and a book. Woo! $476. Yikes. And let's take a look at Idaho's best comedian. Who do you think it is? That's right, it's 29-year-old Dylan Hunter. Dylan clinched the Sasquatch Trophy at the three-day Idaho's Best Comedian competition. Three days. He said, my dad used to tell me if you can make one person laugh, you can make the whole world laugh. That is not true. I can make one person laugh. Someone's laughing right now at that line. I can't make the whole world laugh. And my mom would say, what are you, a comedian? Yes. As for his look, this is funny. He describes himself as Abraham Lincoln if he gave up. Or Tom Hanks, if Big and Castaway were the same movie. <laughs> I don't even know what he looks like, and that's funny. 
One woman kept shouting at me, you're Idaho City handsome. That's a real story. I wish I came up with that tagline myself, but that's something somebody actually shouted at me. And I was like, "Uh, thank you. I'm taking that. My Tinder profile says, I know, and I'm sorry. Dylan Hunter, Idaho's best comedian. That's your comedy news for today. Follow the show for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. Normal episode tomorrow. Meet you back here.